Ah, uh, yeah, I thought, okay, thank you. Uh, is it, ah, really? What is this? Ah, to, to track yeah. me for the camera. Now you have to turn it on. Let's see. Yeah. Wow. Okay, very good. So let's continue with uh, the morning session. It's a pleasure to have Danny to tell us about unitarity. Right. Uh, so I'll be talking about unitarity constraints in quantum, massive quantum field theories. And this is the work in progress with Joao Pinedones and our master student at EPFL. Okay. So uh, I, I gave uh, a version of this talk already last week in uh, ICTP. So uh, I'll extend it a little bit in the end. So who already heard it might be decoupled for a bit and come back in 20, 25 minutes. So here's the picture of my quantum field theory I have in mind. This is the energy scale. And so this is zero energy. I assume that in the UV at high energies, I have a CFT, UV CFT. Okay, then it is deformed and under RG flow, it flows to low energies, to IR. I also assume that in the IR, well, I consider theories that in IR are empty. So this means that I have at some energy here, which, I, which is the mass gap, I have first particles. So here in this range of energies, I have asymptotic states or particles. And I will assume that the lightest asymptotic state has mass small m. So this quantum field theory, I can see, well, I can study in two different ways. Well, the first way is basically I consider my CFT. By now, we know how to deal with them very well. So they are described by local operators, infinite amount of local operators, with some scaling dimensions and OP coefficients. Uh, and what I can study are the correlation functions of these local operators. Now, if I have these correlation functions, I deform my CFT <coughs> with some relevant deformation. And then somewhere at lower energies, I still can study correlation functions. So there are various uh, ways how to do it. For instance, Hamiltonian, various Hamiltonian truncation approaches, which can get you this uh, correlation function in this picture. Another way to study quantum field theories here is to forget for a second about the CFT and look at the scattering processes of asymptotic states. OK, so scattering. Asymptotic states. There are various constraints on the scattering processes, and uh, these constraints are studied in the S matrix bootstrap approach or framework. So, uh, in this work we're doing, we try to look at the unitarity constraints. Uh, in such a way that they will mix these two pictures together. So both correlation functions and the S matrix, in principle, they encode the same information, but in a different way. And having a mixed picture between them is, could be potentially interesting. So goal, study unitarity. And then we draw consequences and applications from these unitarity constraints. OK. Before I proceed, I, I will need a couple of 
to define a couple of well-known basic things, but I think it, it can be useful for better understanding to do that. So this part is a little bit uh, technical. Well, okay, so I work in D dimensions. Uh, dimensions in Minkowski space. Here's the metric. It's a mostly plus metric. <coughs> and the here's the momentum of my particles, P mu. I assume that my system, quantum field theory, is invariant under Poincare symmetry. Now, since I talk about, Poincare, about quantum mechanics, I'm interested in unitary representations of the Poincare group. And uh, they were classified by Wigner. They are given the infinite dimensional. And they are labeled a little bit roughly by the, the momentum P mu and the spin, where the spin is the representation of SOD minus one little group, subgroup of the uh, Poincare group. And P squared minus P squared is greater than zero. Okay, so these are irreps. There's a very special type of representation uh, inside these irreducible representations called uh, one particle states. I'll denote them by 1ps. So there are such, part, such states which obey the constraint uh, minus, uh, p squared equals to minus m squared, where m is uh, some discrete real number, and we call it a mass. Okay. So one particle states uh, play a role of fundamental representation, and any other representation can get constructed by taking products of one particle states. So for instance, we can define an n particle state. N times. Okay, so these n particle states, they're instead in the reducible representation. And can be decomposed back to irreducible representations here. What we'll be uh, dealing with here are actually two particle states. And we would like to, so two particle states, so just tensor product of two one particle states, and they can decompose using uh, klebsch gordon coefficients for the Poincaré group. Klebsch. Two irreps. To be very specific, what I will need in this talk is the inverse relation. Uh, let me write it very specifically. And also, I will consider only specific irreps where the spin is actually <coughs> a uh, tracely symmetric representation of the little group. So in the Young tableau form, it's just uh, J uh, symmetrized boxes. So then what I will need is the following. A rep characterized by the total momentum and some spin J is given by some coefficient J an integral over the uh, spherical angle in d minus one dimensions, uh, then the actual two particle state, and we integrate with a spherical harmonic in d minus one dimensions, which is the Gegenbauer polynomial d minus three j cosine theta. Okay. So 
So you see, even if I take a tensor product of two scalar particle states, uh, we actually uh, get a spin part when we decompose them into irreducible representations. Right. Uh, so, uh, Jakob Wick is, well, let's say four dimensions. Then uh, you, you take generic spin representations here, and it's much more complicated. Then you cannot do it in generic dimensions. You really have to work. Um, and then I'll have to. Exactly. Trace is symmetric or simple. Otherwise, you will get here uh, where? Yeah, here, mass. You get helicities. I can ignore talking about helicities. So that was the group theory part. Now the second thing which I, I need, and I will finish the overview, but that was A, is the physical models of physics. Um, basically, I need to define asymptotic states. What do I mean by asymptotic states? I'll assume that my system is described by Hamiltonian <laughs> capital H. And I will uh, work with such systems which can be described, which Hamiltonian can be split in two parts, H0 plus H interaction. So H0 is the free Hamiltonian. <laughs> However, the trick is that this free Hamiltonian, can, uh, its mass spectrum is should be the mass spectrum of the actual full quantum field theory. So for instance, it contains all the composite uh, operators, like pions, for instance. And H interaction should not should not be seen in, in general as a small perturbation. It's something. OK? So one particle states, which uh, were constructed using group theory, at different times, uh, you, you can see this state. Uh, well, this state evolves with the free Hamiltonian, H0t. Our states in interacting theory, they evolved with a full Hamiltonian. So the assumption of the presence of asymptotic states is such, well, assumption. The system can be written in terms of asymptotic states if at some time, large times, t plus or minus infinity, actually, uh, this object looks like a free particle state, the equality. This is a little bit uh, formal. In, in, there are subtleties, like you have to study wave packets, but I don't want to talk about it. So from this equation, I can move this to the left-hand side, and I will define the actual asymptotic states. In this case, I'll call them one particle states, and I refer as plus or minus, meaning in the far future or in the far past, as the limit time goes to plus or minus infinity, uh, minus yeah, IHT, a full Hamiltonian E minus IH0T, the one particle state. What family is the bound state that exists in interaction and not in the If I have two particles that form a bound state, then if I put the interacting Hamiltonian, I have a small passing state corresponding to the bounding. Right. Well, you should include the bound state in the H naught, I believe. Like uh, helium should be like uh, should be there, considered as a some particle. You should include it in H naught. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> this object here is called the Mellor operator. I denote it by omega plus minus. So you see, one particle state cannot evolve to something more complicated. Instead, the symptotic states, they contain a lot of uh, difficult information inside it. And the Miller operator basically provides a link between something very complicated and something simple. What does the Miller operator do on the vacuum? On the vacuum. I 
It's not easy. It's not easy, I guess. Do you have a Do you have the answer? Well, in this construction, you should have three layers. But what we do normally, the murder operator is like the user getting the lower maps and writing on the Right. To the. But with this separation, if you really want to put it in a way that H0 describes everything that you can say to the rapid, then it's very nice. I see. But Yeah. L luckily, I will not need these details. I need just a ver some formal definition. And for instance, to, 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 to show uh, what happens to these asymptotic states, uh, we define our amplitude, scattering amplitude, as some, let's say, two particle asymptotic state in the far future. Uh, the overlap with a two particle state some in the far past. Okay, then I can just use this definition of asymptotic states, and I get two particle state, free, omega plus dagger, omega minus two particle state, which are now free particles. And the product of null operator is the scattering uh, operator S. So let me remove things I don't need. So basically, using these definitions now, uh, let's get to the uh, main uh, object in this work I would like to construct. <laughs> what I will do now is to define three states, psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. So psi one, I take two particle asymptotic state at the far future and project it to some definite spin. Um, ah, yeah, and the PJ projection operator is basically this object here. This is. PJ is basically a integral with a spherical harmonic. Or otherwise, I can write it as projection, molar operator plus 2PS, two particle state, three particle state. So, He, uh, this one, scalars. Oh. Yeah. I thought you were suppressing something. This is no. No. I. I so yeah. I okay. My one particle states are purely scalars, and the spin appears. In the if they. Yes, we assume identical, but you don't have to. In principle, then you have to include all the spins. Uh, yes. Right. There are selection rules for identical particles. Um, right. So the, the state two, so basically you see this is the out state. The psi two state I'll define as the projection of the two particle state in the far past. So this is the in state, which can be written as the projection molar operator two PS. And the third state, and this is the definition, I will take as some local scale operator acting on the vacuum and Fourier transform. Uh, <coughs> okay, so this O is the scale operator. After the Fourier transformation, this state will have total momentum P. 
and these two states have also total momentum p mu. Here, the states have spin j in general. This state has spin j equal to zero because of the scale operator. Yes, this is fully non perturbative local operator. What I would like to study, what are the inner products of these three states? So I'd like to study psi i, psi j, where i and j run from 1 to 3. i, j run from 1 to 3. This, is, this state I put prime just to say that the total momentum of this state is p mu prime. And the total momentum of this state is p mu. Due to translation invariance, we can already see, but uh, we'll see explicitly, that the, uh, there is a delta function. So this uh, product, uh, inner product, is proportional to 2 pi to some d, and the delta function, p prime mu minus p mu. What is left is some 3 by 3 matrix. I'll call it B and put it 3 by 3, which depends only on one variable, on the S Mandelstam variable defined as minus P squared. What uh, I will do next is to actually to construct this matrix, 3 by 3 matrix, and show what are the components more carefully. But before we do it, uh, let me now finally state what do I mean by unitarity. So if I have one sti state in my quantum field theory, if it's a unitary theory, the norm should be non-negative. If I have a mix of states, the equivalent statement that the matrix should be semi-positive definite. So this object should be semi-positive definite for the physical values of S, meaning for the values of momentum that the two particle states can get. In other words, it should be same positive definite for any s greater or equal than 4m squared. Yeah, right. Right. Absolutely. Correct. So basically, uh, what I would like to say that my, uh, for these three states, unitarity requires the following condition. So what we'll do next, let's take a look what kind of matrix B we have. So this is our matrix, B three by three. Okay, let's take a look first at the one one component. So I take an inner product of this state with itself, uh, with its uh, Hermitian conjugate. Due to the definition of the Mill operator, it's unitary. So it will disappear. What we'll get is just a normalization of the two particle state, two particle states with itself, which is defined, it's basically fixed by us as normalization. Plus you have to integrate it when you project. And the normalization are chosen in such a way that basically we get here explicitly one. The same thing happens for the second state. Uh, the Muller operator disappears. We have a normalization of two particle states. And the projection, it's again one, and two, two component. Now let's take a look at the third component, psi three with psi three. And let me write it explicitly. So it's a double integral. OK, 
time. So I take the inner product of this state with itself. Here I have a non-perturbative vacuum and two operators. And here is the Fourier transform of this two-point function. This is the Whiteman two-point function. Two-point function. So notice there's no time ordering. So due to translation invariance, so this depends only on x minus I, y. So one integral simply gives you a delta function, as I already expected here. So I can write explicitly one delta function, p prime minus p. And what I get here is just a Fourier transform of the Whiteman function, which in Weilberg definitions is simply the spectral density with the 2 pi factor. So this is spectral density. Notice that contrary to the chelen lemon representation, uh, when, we, uh, when we talk about time ordered chelen, when we talk about the time ordered product, it's, uh, it's the, the relation with the spectral density is not that simple. With Whiteman function, it's just trivial. So in the third component, I have 2 pi rho, the spectral density of S. Now, let us look at the 1, 2 component, so the inner product of these states. So you see, we have some two-particle states evolving from uh, far past to the far future. And then this is basically uh, the scattering amplitude. But then we have to project it to the uh, definite spin, so we get the partial amplitude, which depends now instead of STU variables, only on S variable. And here I'll have the spin J. And my convention is star. And the 2, 1 component is the same without the star. OK. And finally, what I would like to consider, we have to fill out these places. So I, I would like to take uh, psi 1 with psi 3, the overlap. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll write here. So. Why we don't consider operators with speed? For simplicity, for simplicity. Indeed, that's true. So, in general, we, 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 to get some stronger constraints. No, I would. If if you want to talk about tracely symmetric, no. No, it's not really. No. Maybe we can include it even. Okay, so basically what we get here is the projection to the definite spin, uh, one Fourier transform, IP dot X, some two particle state, null operator psi dagger of X zero. So you see this matrix element here mixes Two particle asymptotic states, something given by S matrix, with uh, some local operator. So it basically gives you an overlap. When the local operator acts on the vacuum, it creates something very complicated. And this object gives an overlap, overlap of this something complicated with the two particle state. You can now, I'll not uh, write explicitly, you can now use translational symmetry to shift this operator to the center coordinate at x0 perform the integration, what you get is, you get the overall. Yes. Right. OK. Then I have the delta function, so the overlap only with uh, zero spin. That's what Ricardo was saying. Then I'll get some coefficients. I'll, I'll denote it by omega. This is just some known numerical coefficient. And here I get two particle state, omega plus dagger, 
local operator at x equal to 0 acting on the vacuum. So this guy is, the, is known as the form factor. I denote it by F2 of S. OK. So basically, now I can fill the remaining things. They, they will be simply omega uh, Kronecker delta J omega F2S omega J0 omega. So here's complex conjugate. Here again, the form factor. And here, I don't have space. So basically, it's form factor um, star with uh, the same prefactors. OK. So here's the matrix, which should be semi-positive definite. And it contains three important ingredients for us, the partial amplitudes, the form factors, and the spectral density. OK, now I can remove it, all of it. Yes? Uh, right, that Ricardo asked the same thing. No, we don't have, it, it was done for simplicity. Uh, if we add traces symmetric operators, it will not complicate the setup. There's no F1 here. And local operator. In and out is the same, two-particle state. It's the same? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same, it's the same. Yeah. So then you use CPT for the difference. Yeah, you're right. I'm skipping this data, sure. Well, in fact, I, I think we, I'm convinced we use time uh, reversal symmetry to relate two form factors, because in general, there are two of them. Let's, uh, let's talk about it right after. So I have only 15 minutes and <laughs> left, unfortunately. I'm going very slow today. Um, but let's get to the consequences. I will, and then I hope I'll have a little bit of time to talk about the bootstrap. First of all, let me try to speed up. If I take the spectral density in the limit of large S, uh, we're probing the, our UV fixed point, our CFT. So this is given by the spectral density of the UV CFT uh, of S. And since the spectral density is nothing but the Fourier transform of the two-point function, and the two-point function is completely fixed by the conformal symmetry, here we get some number, S to, some power, to the delta, where delta is the scaling dimension of operator O, minus D over 2. So my UV com completeness uh, puts a constraint on the tail of the spectral density. That's one. Second, what I'd like to say is uh, to apply the uh, Sylvester criterion for the matrix to be semi-positive definite. It states that all the principal minors of this matrix should be positive or non-negative. If we took, take a look at this uh, minor here, it leads to the this standard condition that the partial wave absolute value squared should be greater than equal than one. Clearly visible from here. The same if we look at this minor here, we get the constraint that <coughs> two pi rho spectral density is greater than equal than omega squared form factor two squared. This constraint is also expected. Now, the non-trivial constraint, something new, uh, probably we didn't think about before, is when we consider the whole determinant of this matrix. 
and I'll write it here. So it's basically 2 pi rho, 1 minus S0. Should be greater or equal than 0. So this constraint mixes all three ingredients together. The third? OK, so these are the unitary constraints written in a more conventional form. Finally, let's discuss the energy range of S between uh, the Malmstam variable from 4m squared to 9m squared. In this regime, our uh, two particle symptotic states don't have enough energy to evolve to something more difficult, like three particle states. They don't have enough energy. The same thing for the local operator. A Fourier transform of it cannot create anything uh, more complicated than a two particle state in this regime, which I refer as elastic. So basically, we have only one linearly independent state. And what, as a consequence, that there is only one linearly independent state is that we have two zero eigenvalues of this matrix. This can be written in the following form. The characteristic polynomial, which is determinant of B, minus lambda, the identity matrix, 3 by 3, has the form lambda squared, lambda minus lambda 0 where lambda zero is the v non-zero eigenvalue. <coughs> and two other eigenvalues are zero, so reflected by this factor here. This leads to the following constraints. First of all, these two bounds, first two equations, must be saturated. So I have sj absolute value square should be equal to 1, 2 pi rho should be equal to omega squared F2 squared. And the third constraint looks like this. Is the form factor 2 equal to the S0 F2 star? OK, so this is a non, rather non-trivial relation between the partial amplitude and the form factor. In two dimensions, these equations in 2D, they're referred as Watson's, Watson's equations. OK. The intuitive interpretation of this inequality? No, I would say I don't have. So what we would like to play is a numerical, numerical game and see what happens. Uh, we played the game. I didn't get any for now uh, intuition. But uh, let me get to the numerical game. Yes. Why not? I mean, I don't have in mind any particular theory, so I. No, no, exactly. Let me. Okay, I basically have five minutes, and. <laughs> I'll try in five minutes tell you probably the most interesting application. So what we'd like to know is, can we do something uh, with these unitarity constraints in this particular form? And yes, we have a very good numerical algorithms uh, which solve linear uh, optimization pro problems put in this form. So what we can try to do is to write an ANSAT, a generic ANSAT, 
uh, for these quantities entering uh, in this matrix. So for instance, the, from now on, I will focus on two dimensions. Okay? Two dimensions to, to avoid uh, complications due to speed. I can then parameterize my scattering amplitude in the following way. Due to presence of asymptotic states, I have a pole at the mass m squared. And the, and the residue, which I denote by g squared, is basically indicates how strongly these asymptotic states interact with each other. The rest is some analytic function on the complex plane of S modular branch cuts. So basically, I look at the complex plane S of this process. We have branch cuts here, zero, form squared. It's analytic all over the place, and there is one pole. So this is known. Uh, it's now well studied parameterization in this form. It turns out that the form factor can be written also, and it also has the same analytic structure. The pole now has the form minus S minus M squared. Here I have the coupling G instead. And here enters one point form factor. This is a non-trivial statement, and I don't have time to, to motivate it, why it's like that. But uh, I'll just mention that the one form factor is a constant, some constant in which describes my theory, plus the analytic piece on the complex plane modular branch cuts. The spectral density, I can, it's a real function, positive function. I can parameterize it easily. Okay, there's no problem. And then I can ask some questions, try to minimize or maximize some coupling constants. Here will be some unknown coefficients. This is a known coefficient. I can try to vary them, ask some questions in such a way that the matrix is semi-positive definite. Okay. Yes, sorry. I impose that this S is crossing symmetric. Uh, so basically, um, whatever I write, I'll add the piece uh, as goes to uh, 4 minus s. Right, right, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so the interesting game in two dimension, a new bootstrap problem we, can, we thought of, is the following. As a local scale operator, I will consider now the <laughs> theta operator, which is the trace of the stress tensor, defined as T mu mu of x. If we take this local operator, there are, since it's a stress energy tensor, its normalization is fixed because I can form a Hamiltonian out of this stress tensor. And Hamiltonian, we know how to act, uh, uh, act on the states. The states are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, right? And as a consequence of this normalization, we get that the form factor two of theta at s equal to zero is equal to minus two m squared. This is a non-trivial statement. I wanted to show it today, but I don't have time. If you're interested, I'll be happy to talk later. Another important property of the uh, 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 trace of the stress tensor in two dimensions is its relation to the C theorem. So basically, the C theorem can be written, the homology of C theorem, in the following form. The central charge in the UV minus the central charge in IR is equal to minus 3 over 4 pi and the integral over the coordinate space. of the two-point function of the trace of the stress tensor. Since I work with the 
theories which are empty in the IR. This is zero. Now, the two-point function is related to the spectral density. So I get, finally, the following expression, that the CUV is 3 over pi, 0 to infinity ds spectral density of theta s squared. OK, now is, comes the, the bootstrap problem. Suppose I deal with some asymptotic states which scatter with some particular strength, so given the coupling G here. I would like to know what is the minimal value of the spectral density I can find. More precisely, I would like some integrated quantity, which is the central charge. So given some G, what is the minimum of the central charge in the V fixed point? In other words, given some very strong interaction, we would expect, I would like to expect that such massive quantum theory comes from some CFT with this kind of minimal charge. Okay, so here's the preliminary results we get. They're as follows. There is a critical value of G when the problem is unfeasible. And Right. Is this, is, could you also put, of course, <coughs> intuitive, actually say that the theory is very hard to see if it's all one point, okay? Some larger theory, then everything is recovered. Let me, so of yeah. Course, this, I mean, of course, the theory is much richer, it's a much richer thesis. Okay, let me, let me say le less strong statement. This should be a positive quantity, the spectral density, from the Sylvester criterion, this, this minor, right? So if I want to look at some minimum, at it might be that it's zero, because the numerical algorithm will try to minimize this quantity and set it to zero, right? So we know that at least there is a minimum, which is trivial, okay? And the hope is if we run numerics, okay. we can get some uh, stronger bound than zero. And we do get a stronger bound than zero, unfortunately not strong enough uh, to satisfy us for now, but it's a preliminary result. So that's what we get. At zero coupling, there is basically the curve like that, 0 0.3, uh, here's uh, 0 0.2. The curve goes like this. Here is the allowed region for the central charge. And we exclude this area. So this yellow part is excluded. We check that the bound becomes unfeasible at some point G. And this is consistent with a uh, S-matrix bootstrap paper, where uh, guys put uh, the bound on the maximal coupling of this G. So this matches precisely. Unfortunately, the, all the physical unitary models in the CFT, uh, they obey the constraint that CUV is greater or equal than one half. And one half is saturated by the 2D IC model. So you see how our bound for now is much weaker. Uh, I think we have a working hypothesis why it is that. Uh, and this is related to the uh, numerics, how the numerical alg algorithm works. So it basically, they try to saturate, uh, I, I deleted this bound, 2 pi rho, this is the bound.
that the spectral density is actually given only by the two particle state, excluding three, four, etc. particle states. However, they probably give a, an important contribution. So the central charge we get actually is just the contribution from the uh, two particle state. We don't know how to fix it, but uh, well. Uh, yes, exactly. So the the whole okay, good. So here at the boundary, we know uh, that there is the sine Gordon model, integrable model, and the the central charge of the sine Gordon is the, of the is come from the free boson. And the central charge is one. Why, why is it sine Gordon? Well, you found it. That is a sign. Minus sine Gordon. Good point. So uh, I was talking about the um, very simple setup. So since the expert, I assume there's a presence only of one asymptotic state. Now, if I include two asymptotic states with masses m and m and capital M. Now I'll assume some Z2 symmetry, and I'll replace my pole here by M squared. Then in this regime, I will get the sine Gordon. And in fact, I check that the S matrix here, well, I checked yesterday, that it, it does correspond to the sine Gordon. So we reproduce, we recover your results. Plus we get the form factor and the spectral density which we still haven't checked with the analytics. But do you expect that the form factor that you get is the correct form factor of syndrome? Uh, no? <coughs> I, I think it should be correct. Uh, the, the, the spectral density is not, because it's only uh, get, we get the contribution of the two form factor. But the form factor itself, I, it should. And I hope it is. Sorry, this part is a little bit preliminary, so I wish I could. Exactly. It 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 gotta be because the Watson's equations are built in this setup. Gotta be. Right. So I'm done. I basically conclude uh, here. So what we did is to consider a mixed setup where we have correlation functions and asymptotic states. We constructed some matrix which should be semi-positive definite. This is a nice constraint, powerful constraint. And we basically studied uh, various applications and consequences of these constraints. Thank you very much. So what, what what would you expect? No, uh, I, 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 I there should be a physical way to state. There should be a way to physically. I see. I see. It should. It should. I see. No, we didn't. No, we didn't think in these terms. I don't have much intuition, but naively you want to choose some O that you choose the trace of T, <laughs> but there is another O which is the one that deforms the CFT to the other theory, which I guess is giving masses to the phi. So you right. could use that O more naturally. Sure, sure. In print, yes, that's correct. Uh, in a sense, 
we didn't go to specific uh, deformation, specific models. But as soon as we have something at hand, yeah. But you are very far away, right, from the starting point, so. I said, yeah, it's not going to give anything else. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Thanks for a beautiful talk. Thank you. Okay. Barack will give the last talk of the morning. Okay, well, 12, 11, I hope no one's hungry. No. Okay, um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the S matrix of 2D uh, Ising field theory. Um, I'll try to be quick and uh, just help me by asking questions wherever I'm being too quick. Um, so uh, let's start by uh, what the Ising field theory is. So the Ising, Ising field theory <coughs> is defined as the formation of the Ising CFT. The Ising CFT has two relevant operators, so we deform by both with Some arbitrary parameters, M, F, and H. Now, um, M, F, and H are dimension faults, so the spatial theories that we're looking at are defined by one dimensionless parameter. We call it eta, and uh, people loosely call it the temperature, but um, that would be M, F divided by absolute value of H. We can allow ourselves the absolute value because of the Z2 symmetry of the Ising CFT, um, 8 fifteenths. Now, um, so what, what are we looking at? Uh, the, the earliest starting point for this is, uh, if you look at this, would be eta going to minus infinity, eta going to plus infinity, and eta equals zero. These are the three points that we understand, that were understood first. At this point, we have a free fermion theory. It's basically a pure mass deformation of the, of the Ising CFT. Um, at this point, strictly minus infinity, we have a free fermion theory. But while on this side, when we start deforming away, the fermions are weakly coupled, on this side, they are confined in sort of a, you can think of it as sort of a flux tube theory or something like that, when you're uh, very close to minus infinity. And uh, at uh, eta equals zero, we have the E8 theory, which is a no, well-known integral theory uh, with eight particles. And, uh, but, uh, well, we know the S matrix, uh, for the theory, of course, um, I'm not going to discuss it today too much. But uh, if you want to read more about this region, um, there's a, there, there are some logical papers of, about all of this. So in this region, uh, that would be 0, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4. In this region, be 1, 3, 1, 0, 4, 8, 2, 1. And, uh, well, this is, is easy to find in the literature. Um, so also, the starting point of our work uh, uh, is the end of the, of the, of the Malogikov's research here. So an, another important paper is this paper where the analytic properties of the free energy are, uh, uh, as, a, as a function of eta, are analyzed. So, we expect the theory to be more or less analytic as a function of eta. Well, analytic on the, on the real line as a function of eta. So the free energy is the easiest thing to, to analyze. We look at it as a, as a function of eta analytically. Um, now, uh, what, we are, what we have done is we try to understand qualitatively. There are some 
uh, guesses about the structure, the analytic structure of the S matrix, again, as a function of eta. So that means the location of the poles is a function of eta, where the zeros are is a function of eta, um, particle production is a function of eta. Uh, we are trying to get a more solid quantitative hold of that. So what I'm going to discuss today is this side. The, uh, well, today, uh, it's unreadable. Um, the, only the positive temperature uh, part, which is interpolating between the C8 point and the, yeah. So, um, to discuss the analytic properties of the S matrix, I'm just gonna gloss over the details of what, what are the analytic properties of S matrices in 2D. So, I'm only going to discuss the S matrix of the lightest particle, four of the lightest particle. So we're going to have some P1 momenta, P2, and by momentum conservation, this has to be minus P1, minus P2. All incoming, of course. So um, we're going to have only one Mandelstam invariant, which is minus P1 plus P2 squared. And T is going to be 4M squared minus S. And I'm going to make my life easier already now. And uh, set M squared to one, set M to one. Um, yeah, we do it more carefully in the paper, but here I'm just gonna make my life easy. And u is zero. Of course, we could have taken the branch where u is non-zero and t is zero. Um, now, if we look at this, now this is a function s. Uh, it's uh, well, basically, if I'm if I'm looking at the at the out state of uh, at the out state of two particles, it would be some function s times the instant of two particles plus um, other states. So we're looking at that, at that, at that function. Its analytic structure was already discussed uh, even right now. So um, we have some branch cut starting at four, well, for now, four m squared and some branch cut ending at zero. There could be poles here corresponding to stable particles in the theory. Uh, they should come in pairs because of uh, crossing symmetry. And uh, we could have zeros, but because of crossing, they have to come in this kind of pairs. And because of real analyticity, of course, if I have real analyticity, this is the complex conjugate of this. So if I have a zero here, I will have a zero here and here as well. Um, okay, and uh, very important for us would be unitarity that just constrains the physical values of the S matrix which means the value is right on, on top of this cut uh, to be smaller than one. Now, of course, that means that also here, here and here, the values are smaller than one because of crossing. Um, let's see. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you that when we have a zero here, this corresponds to the pole on the second sheet. Um, I don't know, maybe to some of you that's, uh, that's well known. I'm not going to explain it because just I don't want to spend time on that. The easiest way to see it is to go to change variables to the rapidity variable, and then it's easy to analytically continue to what corresponds to the second sheet here and see that uh, <clears throat> S of the second sheet is just one over S of the first sheet. So, so it's trivial that when I have a pole here, and uh, when I have a zero here, I have a pole at the same location in the second sheet which means that I have a resonance in my theory. Um, let's see, so from now on, I'm gonna call the zeros resonances. I know that some people call zeros on the real line virtual particles instead of, I mean, I, I will be maybe wrong and call them resonances as well, but zeros in general. So um, now there is another convenient parametrization that we are going to use. Instead of looking at S as a function of the energy, we're going to look at S as a function of a variable z. This variable z was, uh, well, some of you know it, know, know it, of course. I read it in papers of some of you. And um, this is the definition. Well, of course, I wrote the definition with the rapidity. Uh, OK, so for completeness, I owe you the definition of the rapidity as well just to make people's life harder. Um, so 
So uh, if you want to see what z is as a function of s, just work a little bit harder. But uh, that's not the important point right now. The important point is how it maps to the unit diff. So it maps this part of the, of the, of the plane to the unit disk. It kind of opens up this part, this cut. So this cut will become this and this. Okay. Now, this line is just glued together. So if I come through here, the values here are the same as the values here. So I can just glue this line to this, to this line. It will correspond to it will correspond to here. Okay. So <clears throat> just the values of the function here will be the values of the function here. Any poles will be mapped to this part. Um, this is just purely a different way to look at the to parameterize the kinematics. It's I'm I'm not doing anything. Um, and the actual values, the physical values of the S matrix, now appear here, as I as I said. Um, okay. So we got basically we took just one copy of the of the of uh, under um, uh, crossing instead of both copies. Now I can write down the general solution for the S matrix. where this part encodes all of the poles and the zeros, okay? So if I have, I can have also zeros here, I can have a zero here, I can have a zero here, but then I must have its complex, uh, its complex uh, image because here I have real analyticity and this map preserves that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Of course, I'm not, I'm not telling you what the zeros of the theory are, but I'm telling you that I can decompose the S matrix of the theory to two factors, one including the zeros, uh, and the poles. And one, so the reason I wrote them like this is because now they have modulus one on the boundary of the disk. So they don't affect, what, what do we have on the boundary of the disk? This is the physical S matrix. Somewhere here is the either three particle threshold or the M1 plus M2 threshold. So up to here, the absolute value of the S matrix it will be one. Once we cross this threshold, the absolute value of the S matrix will be reduced. It, it will not saturate unitarity anymore because there are other channels where I can scatter. To, to which I can scatter. So, <clears throat> so this does not change the saturation of unitarity. Any S matrix that we write only with CDD factors will saturate unitarity. That's why any uh, integrable S matrix is just a bunch of CDD factors, and this is trivial in, that, in those cases. But in a generic S matrix, we do have um, inelastic processes, and uh, this will correspond to a factor of this form. Okay. Um, okay. Now, basically, the idea is that, uh, given some profile on the boundary of the absolute value of the S matrix, we cannot uniquely determine an analytic function inside, but we can uniquely determine an analytic function up to zeros and up to zeros inside. So the fact that we already accounted for all of the zeros here. Um, allows us to reconstruct this, uh, the, the, this, this analytic function with the correct absolute value um, on the boundary. Um, 
Yeah, we basically just, we can reconstruct an analytic function from its real values, right? So if we have some absolute values on the boundary, we take the log of it, that, so we, as long as there are no zeros inside, it will still be analytic inside, the log of that function. Um, <clears throat> and now what was the absolute value when we take the log becomes the real part of the log. So we can just reconstruct it with the standard formula. So the real part and take the exponent again. I guess these are technical details. That's not the, not, not the, not crucial right now. Um, now, okay, so now we have basically the analytic structure. So I can tell you what I'm trying to get. What am I trying to get? I'm trying to understand what are these zjs as a function of eta. What are these zjs as a function of eta? Maybe let's give a prime to one of them so that, so that we can, I can loosely call them zj. Uh, so zj and zj prime. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful in understanding this sigma tot uh, as a function of eta. Here phi is just the argument of some, some, para, some, uh, um, some uh, coordinate on the disk. So I'm hopeful for finding this, and, I'm, and, and I also want to find these. Um, so this is a very hard problem in general to, to just you know, look at this and expect to solve it without any input from the theory. Uh, or, or just impossible. So I'm going to have some experiment giving me some input to my, to my research. So the experiment would be TFFSA. Um, this is not something that we developed. This appears, I think, first. I mean, it's just a Miltonian truncation, so it appears a lot. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. E to I phi, E to I phi. W is the, is, the, is, the, is the coordinate for which phi is the argument. Sorry, thanks. Um, okay, so this uh, first appears, it, oh, I just erased it, so. The use of Hamiltonian intrication for this theory specifically first appears in this paper. Hamiltonian intrication is, dates, uh, is, is much older, of course. Um, we write the Hamiltonian of IFT as the Hamiltonian of free mass, free mass fermion. That means we do, first we do this deformation, and then we solve completely. Well, of course, it's just a massive free fermion theory, so, so that, that shouldn't be hard. And uh, then we add the second deformation. And we put the theory on a large cylinder. Um, now, the fact that we put it on a cylinder makes the, um, the, the, the um, spectrum quantized, and the fact that, and then we do it, and, and then we will do an, a truncation, which will make it finite. So, basically, I can write a vector of states up to some right-going momenta uh, using uh, just in the free theory. Okay, that's easy. I'm writing all of the states up to some right-going momenta, and then I'm matching them with left-going momenta so that I'm in a zero-momenta sector. And then I can just write this becomes in that, in that, in that uh, truncated to that uh, finite basis, this becomes just a matrix. I can write this matrix, I can diagonalize it, and I can get some approximation of the spectrum of the theory on this, on this cylinder of radius, of radius R. Um, yeah, this is just standard Hamiltonian location. Uh, so we have data sets with labels R for the radius of the cylinder and L for the level truncation that we chose. Um, from this, we get two things, which will be our experimental data. The first one is the mass spectrum. To get the mass spectrum, we just take this set of these results. We extrapolate L to infinity. Then we have the non-truncated, I mean, an approximation to the non-truncated results for some radius r, and then we extrapolate r to infinity. So we get, we get some approximation of the mass spectrum of the theory. The second thing that we get is the two particle states. So we get the energies of two particle states. We get the energies of two particle states, and we can use uh, just uh, Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization on a circle to extract from that the S matrix. 
So we are neglecting a lot of finite size effects, but we're hoping that our, the radius, the, the cylinders that we chose are big enough so that we don't have to worry about it right now. Of course, one can worry about that, and that hopefully can improve the results, but, uh, but we didn't. Um, okay, so to repeat, what we get is the mass spectrum, which gives us the first thing that we wanted, but that's, that, that was actually well understood before by Zamalogikov. These are the ZJs here of the, <coughs> sorry, this is a, this, <coughs> the flight is getting to me. The ZJ primes here. Um, uh, but what, the other thing that we get, which is, um, of course, again, was well known how to do it before, but, but we have it to pretty high accuracy because it's been a few years since the last person did it and the computers are better, is the two particle states, which, um, the two particle states which give us the elastic scattering, okay? Using, uh, basically, if we are under, if we are under this uh, threshold, right, we can do, uh, we can quantize the two particle states on a circle by just requiring that when we take one across the other, it will just scatter with it using the S matrix if the circle is, is large enough, um, which gives us just a simple quantization condition from which we can extract this, which is the phase of the S-matrix. The scattering phase is an sc elastic scattering phase. Okay, I hope this is clear. I'm trying, I, I yeah, okay. Um, okay, in this case, we can extrapolate the level to infinity, and we do, but we can't extrapolate R to infinity. That's why I was saying before, we have this, um, we might have finite size effect affecting our, our result. Because if we try to extrapolate R to infinity, um, of course, we will get all of these will be trivial. We have to have some finite R to get some non-trivial result from this. Um, okay, so all of these details are not the main um, analysis that we did in the paper, but I had to have them to uh, to discuss it. Uh, Sorry, your patient is still a flat space patient. Oh yeah, 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 it's a flat. I, I'm sorry. I want the flat space shift phase shift, but I'm taking it. I'm, I'm to approximate it. I'm just taking a large cylinder. I'm not really taking the. I'm not extrapolating R to infinity. I don't have a way to do it. I mean, I could do it if I had enough. If I could go to a large, large enough radius so that I could consider um, just the density of states under some energy. But my problem is that I can't really right now. I can't go to large enough cylinder with the truncation that I have. So I have to consider the actual states I'm getting, and I can't extrapolate R to infinity. Um, but we, we can identify the finite size effect when you see them, and, and it seems that we can kind of truncate them out. It's, it, seems, it seems okay. But I, this, this is definitely the most heuristic decision that we made. So, yeah. um, so a range of these things. Now, let's say that I'm looking at some specific R, and I get some, uh, this is the energy. I get, let's say, some masses, and this is this is M1. This is really small. This is the energies. I get some mass M1, and this is 2M1. Maybe I get another mass here. Maybe this is M2. And now I get some state here, here, and I guess this is already 3M1. But I get some states here, two particle states, okay? Now, these two particle states, each one of them gives me one data point for this phi. So if this is the energy, if this is S, let's say S, and this is phi, or our argument of the S matrix, I can get, say, one, two data points from this. And then I choose another radius, and I get two more data points. And maybe I have more states than two, so I got a few more data points here and here and here, and slowly I'm starting to build a graph of this, uh, of the argument of the S matrix on the elastic phase. So I can get only up to the, to this threshold where I start producing other states. So eventually you will get some, we get some, some graph 
for this uh, for the S matrix, and we call that together with the mass spectrum our experimental the results of our experiment. Okay, so we can start the analysis from here. Everything up to here <clears throat> is kind of a setup. So this is my input. My input is the data here and here, right? Because this is just a complex conjugate of this and the locations of this axis. Oh yeah, yeah. Pn is just the energy. Uh, Pn is just the momentum of a, of a free, two free part of of one of two free particles that have. Energy. Yeah. This. The. Uh, yes. 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 Thank you. Um, so the. Um, this should be. What am I doing? Squared minus m1 squared, and this this I read also from the data here. So I, I, I yeah there there are that. it's actually best not to take the one that is already extrapolated, but to take the one that is from the same same data set that we're analyzing at the same moment. Um, but but that that's that's uh, maybe that's another heuristic decision. Um, okay. Uh, so we get this thing. Actually, in reality, we get some disjoint set of, of data, but uh, that won't actually won't harm us uh, so much. You can also consider this. This could be as a function of s or as the function of the argument of z. Right? This could be the function of the argument on z here. Uh, uh, this, uh, whatever, whatever is comfortable for you. Now, the question is, what can we say? And the biggest question that we want to answer is this, the location of the zeros. Um, of course, another question we want to answer is what happens with sigma todd, but I'm preparing you that I'm not going to answer the second one very well. So, so um, so um, Let's go to the next part, which is the analytic reconstruction. So I would say this is the main part of our analysis. Um, <clears throat> so you have some, you, I, I told you what you know. You know the values here. You don't know the values here, but you know they're, they're, they're bounded by unitarity, right? They must be. Um, smaller than one, and you know the location of the pole, so you can divide. Let's start by dividing by the pole, so that we actually have an analytic function. Okay, we divide, divide by the factor there of the poles, and let's call that function g. So g would be s divided by uh, poles. Okay, now. Um, <clears throat> Let me start by telling you what we can find. So the analysis that I'm going to do is going to tell you the locations of the zeros. Um, it's going to tell you the uh, our values. It, it's going to, OK. So first, we are able to uh, reconstruct the values of s at arbitrary positions on the, on the disk. Now, you may expect that, because this is an, it's an analytic function, and we know it on the boundary. But we know it with some error. We don't know it exactly, right? Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so the way that we reconstruct it is by using a method that I will explain, uh, and we can find it to very, very, very tight rigorous error bounds anywhere away from that, the, the, the arc that we, that we don't know. So there will be some range here where we are unable to get uh, any information about the function. The, the second thing that we can do, because we are able to re reproduce the values, we can also reproduce the locations of the resonances, the location of the zeros. And specifically, we will be able to kind of, uh, to kind of um, uh, restrain them to be in some islands uh, on this disk. The reason that we can constrain them to be in islands is just because uh, if, we look at the, right, if we look at the change of the argument of an analytic function around some, in, around some uh, region, if there is a zero inside, it will be 2 pi. If there is no zero, it will be zero. If there are two zeros, it will be 4 pi. So um, <clears throat> in, the, 
In this way, when we have an approximation of a function and another function where we know the error bar between them, as long as nowhere on the arc uh, the error allows the approximation to, to gain the value zero, okay? So we have some approximation to the S matrix. As long as nowhere the approximation is allowed to take the, as long as nowhere inside the, the range of the error bar there's the value zero, there cannot be a, a difference between the number of zeros of the approximation and of the actual function. So that means that we can write, we can have islands telling us where the, the, the resonances are, and I, I will get back to that later. Um, and the third thing is we're going to, to have some sum rules on this sigma. And the sum rules are basically we have this, this uh, expression for the, for, the, for, uh, for the S matrix. The sum rules are basically going to say this cannot contribute more than something to the elastic regime. So we can plug in any value in the elastic regime and we have some upper bound on what this integral can be. So we can, I don't know, integral rules. Uh, I, I don't know to, how to understand them intuitively so far. So. I'm sorry? I'm doing this for each value of h. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the results soon. But uh, yeah, I'm doing this all full analysis for, well, not each value, but I'm sampling in values of h. Um, <clears throat> so let me uh, let me start with a. So we have two methods of going from this data that we have into the to the values in the interior. So the first method, which is kind of unstable, but is more intuitively uh, easy to understand, is this: G of Z is just Right? This, this we all know. Now I can also do this. Add some function chi here. That's, as long as this chi is analytic inside the disk, I have no problem to do this. Now, <clears throat> I can divide by chi and throw away the integration over the regime where I don't know, right? I know the values of g here, so I'm just going to integrate where I know. Um, so I can say that G is just 1 over chi Z integration. Let's call the region I know I and the region I don't know J. Integration over I dW I Plus, of course, this is plus some error. Now, I actually know how to evaluate the error, the, evaluate the bound on the error that I can get here. The bound on the error will just be 1 over chi z integral over j dw over 2 pi i. And now, I can just take the absolute value of this the absolute value of this. And I don't have to worry about the absolute value of G because G is bounded by one. If you remember, S was bounded by one because of unitarity and G is divided by only, the, is S divided by the pole factors, which are, which have modulus one on the, on the boundary of the disk. So, <clears throat> so now this is, this is the error that I need to approximate. Yeah, I need, I have for my approximation. And as long as chi inside the disk at the point Z that I'm trying to reconstruct is much, much um, bigger than chi on the boundary, uh, on the boundary, I have the, my approximation will be good approximation. Okay? So let me look at the disk. If I want to approximate the point here, I can find some analytic function that is very small here, very large here, and whatever here. And I will, get, I will be able to use this method to get the approximation for that point. Now, this method is uh, relatively simple, um, but we, it has a few big problems. Um, the first one, to make this finite, while this is um, negligible, I have to make this huge. Okay? 
So any, any error that I have in my numerical data that for now we are not, we are, we are not, um, <clears throat> not dealing with will be, uh, will be magnified by a lot, right? If I have some deviation in my numerical data, I'm, I'm integrating it against a huge thing, I will have to start taking into account the numerical data errors here, which will give me another error factor and I will be, I will be screwed. The second problem is that to make this very small, they're very, uh, sorry, to make this finite, while this is very small, I have to make this very oscillatory. And again, I'm doing an integral with a very oscillatory thing. I'm going to have a lot of problems doing this integral numerically. Um, uh, and, uh, okay. Um, so, the, and the third problem, of course, is the data comes in disjoint arcs. So actually this region I is not really, I have to somehow extrapolate the data here in a reliable way, and that's, that's, that's a nightmare. So, but, but I, I, I do explain this method anyway, because it is, important for the understanding of the, of the second method, which I'm not really going to explain so much. Um, I'm just going to say that the second method is we find, how much time can I, can I take? Yeah. Like eight minutes. Okay. Yes? Um, so there are optimal choices for chi. We actually use them. So the second method basically uses kind of the same approach but we don't need to numerically integrate. Instead, we just, um, I, I will explain it in a moment, but in that case, we use the optimal chi. The optimal chi is basically, you can find it if you think about, if you look at this, this expression and think about it, uh, you can find the optimal chi. As you just have to plug in here something that is finite, finite here and very small here, while demanding that it's one somewhere where, wherever you want it to be finite, um, and that's, that's possible, it will just be super oscillatory. Um, <clears throat> okay, so method two is basically we start with some approximation, we call it G tilde. This approximation is basically me looking at this function and trying to build something. I'm trying to, I'm sprinkling a few zeros and I'm giving it some uh, profile here that I, uh, let's say I take this thing and I expand it as a sum of squares where each one of the squares is, a, is some sum of Chebyshev polynomials with some, with some coefficients. I parameterize this, basically. So I parameterize this, and this is already parameterized as long as I choose some finite number of zeros. Let's say I assume I have six zeros. So this seems a bit arbitrary for now, but I, I promise you it will be justified. So this is some, uh, some CDD factors times some uh, exponential factor, and I have some, uh, some parameters, and then I just numerically fit this parameterized thing to G. I fit, I fit this to G. Um, <clears throat> so once I fit this to G, I have some, some error, I, I, I have some control on the error here because I know what the difference is between this and G on this part. And then to, let's say I just, I just, say, I just tell you, okay, now my, my guess for what is the value of the function here is just g, g tilde at this point. G tilde is some analytic function in the disk. I can just use it as, as my guess. The only thing I have to do is justify it somehow. And the way we do it is we justify it using a lemma, a complex analysis lemma, um, that basically tells you that if you have some fz with the, all assumptions that you took here, analytic and the disk, uh, and so on, such that f, I'm sorry, if you have some fz that you know the, you know the values on a part of the boundary, let's call it, we call this part, part i, we can bound f inside the disk by some expression. Now, <clears throat> tau z is the um, Mobius map that takes zero to z and, keep, and, and doesn't change the disk and preserves the disk. And, 
And when I take this, when I when I take tau of some region and take the absolute value, I mean what I mean by that is the uh, length of the region after the tau minus one map here. So this is, of course, this is a technical expression. You don't have to, you don't have to understand it now. But what I'm telling you is that using methods similar to this analysis, but a bit more technical and tedious, uh, we can bound as long as we know some bound on the function uh, on the boundary, we can bound the function anywhere in the in the disk. On a part of the boundary, you can bound the function anywhere at the disk. We see that this is a function of also the length of the part that we know, which makes sense, and also the values of the function on that part of the boundary that we know. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, oh, of course, bounded by unitarity. I'm sorry. This is this is. Um, yeah, we are. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I I was maybe a bit. A bit sloppy here. Yeah, of course, fz is bounded by two on the boundary. Okay. Um, yes, of course, the boundedness is the only reason that we can do any of that. Um, so now we just choose this f to be, we just choose this f to be the difference between g tilde and g, and we get some very uh, some rigorous error bars uh, inside the bulk of the disk. Uh, from the arrow bars on the boundary, which are just the difference between G tilde and G. Um, so the one thing I will say, this seems um, a little bit prone to errors, numerical errors, but uh, this curve that we looked at, the curve, the, the values of the function on the boundary are highly constrained by unitarity. They have a lot of, uh, like their self, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, self-consistency constraint just by the fact that it's the boundary of a unitary, of a, not unitarity, uh, analyticity, just by the fact that it's boundary values of an analytic function. So, for example, if we had this thing, and now I add some bump here, we had this, we did this experiment, I add some bump here that doesn't really make sense, uh, and I try to fit, I will still get this fit for G tilde, because it's very hard to to have this bound, to have some, some, uh, some weird behavior in, the, in, an, in, a, in a boundary of an analytic function. What I'm trying to say is if we had some numerical error that is very localized and not something that is, that is systematic, it's probable that it's kind of smoothed out by this. Uh, by this uh, I see. Can I take five more minutes? Is that okay? Or? Okay. So I'll just say something about the theory itself because I just told you how we find all of the results and I didn't say anything about what actually happens in the theory. Um, qualitatively, this story was uh, already suggested by Zamalogikov, so uh, we're not claiming any, that any of it is our story, but we can, uh, we can find exactly the, 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 the quantitative uh, numbers of where, where the zeros go at every point. So if we start at eta equals infinity, we have a free theory, so it's kind of boring. Now, as we move away, we have a pole at the, at the origin, self-coupling pole and a zero coming away from the pole. So if we go the other way, it's just that the zero and the pole annihilate, and we get the free theory here. We try to go away a little bit more. The, the zero will go all the way here and cross to the second sheet. Okay, this is basically, this basically outside the, the circle corresponds to the second sheet of the S plane. So we will get the pole coming in. Because of unitarity, when a zero comes out, a pole has to come in. So we will see a picture like this. Now, <clears throat> somewhere here, with, it's very hard to say exactly when, and we are, although we have very good numerical data for a lot, uh, very good quantitative data for a lot of the quantities, I can't say where, what exactly happens at high energies, but at low enough energies, we can see here just one zero emerging from high energies. It could be that there's something super complicated happening here. It could be that it's just one zero coming down. We don't know to say right now. Um, and Eventually, the zero and the pole cross the pole kind of at the same time. So uh, they have, I'm sorry, it has to happen on the same, at the same time because we cannot have a double pole. So if the pole crosses it, crosses this pole, it has to be with, with the zero. Um, <clears throat> and eventually, this zero also crosses to the second sheet and we get another pole. Now, whoever, this is at eta equals zero. This is the familiar picture of the, uh, well, to some people, familiar picture of the EA theory. In the EA theory, in the S matrix of the lightest particle, you can see only the two higher, part, uh, the self-coupling and the two higher particles, and none of the, of the, of the other particles. Um, 
We can also see here some resonance of zero appearing here and slowly moving uh, um, slowly moving towards uh, hitting the boundary here where it becomes the fourth mass. So the fourth mass of the, you can think about it the other way, maybe it's easier. If we start on the A theory, there is the fourth mass. It's a state in the theory. When we slightly go away from the E8 point, it becomes unstable and uh, appears a as a resonance here. We can see that we can put an, an island for where the resonance is. That we expect to have similar resonances for the fifth, sixth, and uh, seventh, and eighth uh, particles, but we can't see them right now because they are very close here. They should be somewhere here, so it's very, we don't have a method to see them right now. Um, in terms of results, we have graphs for the, I don't know, the self-coupling, we can give a graph with like very, very tight error, error bars and uh, for the evolution of each one of these zeros, but that's not, I mean, I can't give you the quantities here that are interesting, so you can see some very tight error bars for the, well, this means nothing. Uh, for the evolution of this, this zero, for example, or this zero, I can tell you uh, that it, where, where it goes, at which eta, and, and, and as you can see, the error bars, when it becomes, this is where, this would be one, this would be minus one. So the, here the zero appears, and as we go to, um, to larger eta, somewhere around eta equals two, it, it, with, I can't say if it actually exists, because the error bar is, is, it basically envelops all of this region. I guess the one last thing that I will say is, uh, we compare this with perturbation theory with a lot, of, a lot of success. It seems to match very well with perturbation theory in the region where it should. Um, and uh, there should be a much more interesting pattern on the other side. So we're working on that now on, and on the negative eta side. Uh, and we can, the, the most important thing that we can do maybe is we can look at, this, at, the, at the disk and we can create this kind of exclusion plots where we say, here we could have more resonances, but here there are no more resonances than the ones we found. So we can say we can really justify this guess about the number of resonances, um, of course, up to some energies and widths that we, that we can't really probe. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Right, right. I see. And then uh, for it equals zero, when the zero touches the boundary, yes. it means that you like a stupid elastic of the modulus, so this has to cross zero for this point. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. What, what, what do you mean? When I look at the spectrum, what do I see? Or? No, I'm saying when you look at the phase sheet for it equals zero. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you see that. I mean, since the zero, you put the zero on the bound, it means that you like a stupid elastic. Oh, oh, you mean, yeah. Um, like uh, you mean this kind of thing? Yeah, well, I can't really. So if I go very close to zero, I can see this thing kind of, kind of become, uh, uh, appearing. Of course, at, at, at strictly zero, it's just, it's just continuous again. But uh, I mean, it, it, it just, it, I mean, at, at zero, you will not see this. this, this, this. If, if you would do the, this procedure, Strictly at zero, you will not see this, this wall. You would just see uh, the, the phase of the... Yeah. Yeah, when they touch, they cancel. Of course, I have a pole coming from the other side. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. I have, uh, for every, every the se as, as, uh, yeah, the outside of the disk is the second sheet. Um, I mean, in some sense. So, so, when, you, when a zero comes to the boundary, you have a pole coming from the outside, canceling it. Yeah. Thanks. The first, the, oh, here, from infinity. You don't have a pole going out, because that's infinity. Because that's infinity. That's the only point that's allowed to, to act. Uh, but in principle, oh yeah, because the, the, in the free theory, also outside in second shift, you have nothing. No zero. Yes. The, the first zero going out in the second picture to the 
<laughs> oh, it is. So, so the thing is. So, so uh, it, the, they do annihilate, but then they cross each other. Cross yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't think they are allowed to completely annihilate that, uh, in an analytic point. Yeah. yeah. I think if if it was at infinity, sure. But. Oops.